Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. It's great to have such a full room. And I love these round tables. I hope people get a chance maybe afterwards to introduce themselves. It'll be like Dries and tell people, hey, go meet your neighbor. Um, it's a great part of DrupalCon. Um, so we're going to be chatting today about rebranding or revamping your, your, your website and really getting the most out of your existing, um, your existing design, your existing website. Um, for those who haven't met me, my name's Suzanne Dargacheva. I'm one of the co-founders of Evolving Web. We're a, a Drupal agency that has a higher ed specialty as well as a Drupal specialty. Um, and I also run the Promote Drupal initiative. So a lot of the things Dries was talking about this morning, about there being this marketing toolkit for Drupal, I, I've, been, I've been working on a lot of that. So I would love to chat with you about all, all these things, and I have my email address up there um, if you want to continue the conversation after this. And good afternoon. My name is John Cloyes. I'm with Princeton University. I do uh, web and digital initiatives there as well. Yeah, and, and we've been partnering together on a project for the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton, so we'll be using that as an example here today to kind of illustrate some of what we're talking about. Um, so the, the main thing that we want to get across with our presentation is that when you launch a new site, and I'm sure many of you have, have heard this or hold this to be true, um, the, the launch is really just the beginning of the whole cycle of using a website. It shouldn't be sort of the end of story, it should be the beginning of, of a new cycle. And when we look these days at how much time we have between redesigns, we're often looking at a surprisingly short amount of time. Um, so I don't know, how many here have redesigned their website in the last five years? In the last three years? In the last two years? Yeah, so quite, quite, quite a large number. Um, I think redesigns are pretty common. And a lot of us might have redesigned our website recently because we had to upgrade from Drupal 7. So you might be in that situation. Um, but nonetheless, I'm seeing tons of projects where people are coming to us with a Drupal 10 website um, and they would like a redesign. And it's not being pushed by technology. It's being pushed by this drive to, to change and to innovate and to to do better. Um, so what I always like to ask in these situations, you know, when people are saying, oh, we really, we really want to do a redesign, we really need a fresh look, um, is what is pushing that decision? So when you say, you know, we want to do a full redesign or a full rebrand, um, you know, why, why is that the case? Why do we need to start from scratch? And on some projects, it's because there's a literally a rebrand. So when we think about, you know, institution-wide um, or, uh, you know, as an, or as an enterprise, like, oh, we are actually coming up with a new brand. We've changed our identity. Um, we need to start from scratch in terms of the look and feel. Sometimes that's what's pushing it. But sometimes it's these other drivers, like there's a technology upgrade, like how many of you have done a redesign because of a, a, you know, an, a migration to the newest version of Drupal? Yeah, a lot of us are saying, oh, well, we have to update the technology anyway. Let's just redesign to make it look more modern. Um, but sometimes it's these other pesky issues, like, oh, new leadership comes in and says, well, I'm going to put my stamp on this project, I'm gonna put my stamp on this organization, we're gonna take a new, a new direction, or there's a new strategy or a new audience or a new services you're trying to offer. Um, but I think in an ideal world, we should be um, thinking about, you know, yes, investing in a, in a complete redesign when a rebrand is necessary, but thinking more about making investments in our websites for all of these reasons, instead of always just jumping straight to let's start from scratch. So in an ideal world, yes, sometimes we would rebrand and we would um, you know, completely redo the design of our website, but between those bigger events, we would be making investments in improving our content and doing user research and in, you know, if there is a new strategy, maybe we don't have to start from scratch, but rather we can reorient things around our new audience. 
So today we're going to be talking about some tactics of how to, to operate in this way um, and to kind of maybe change our thinking a little bit in terms of how we're investing in our, in our websites. So I'm going to start with a couple examples, and then we're going to lead into the um, example of the, the bigger SPIA project that we've, we've both worked on. Um, so, so we'll talk about these as different stories. Now, how many people here are in higher education? Because I think we put higher ed in the title. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. So these roundtables are great. Afterwards, you should all meet each other if you haven't already. Um, so the, these are all higher ed examples. Um, but if you're not in higher ed, I find, um, you know, often public sector, government organizations, you have a lot of the same challenges, a lot of the same um, kind of goals that we're working towards, so I'm sure you'll find some, some interesting tidbits as well. So the first example is from um, uh, OCAD University. They're kind of like the RISD of Canada, uh, Rhode Island School of Design, um, because they're the biggest design school in Canada. And so they have a really strong brand, and obviously they take the look and feel of their websites very seriously. And yet, if you look at their um, OCADU.ca, as it stood when we started this project, uh, it was quite a overwrought information architecture that was a, really a challenge to, to work with. And as a big you know, fairly big design school, they have a lot of content that they're trying to um, that they're trying to maintain in one large installation. How many of you are in that situation where you've got kind of a mega site that's trying to do it all? I find those, those projects always particularly challenging, especially from an information architecture point of view when you're trying to have the, you know, the alumni website and the admissions website and all the faculty information all in one site. It's really an incredible amount of information. Um, and then when they were looking at refreshing the, the uh, process of recruiting students and having a nicer flow for admissions, it just seemed impossible to do it in the main website. Um, and they also wanted to push the boundaries of their brand, but again, that, that's sort of an intimidating thing for a design school to do because there was a lot of pressure on that process. So we thought, well, what a great opportunity to create a new microsite, to say, like, let's create an admissions site as a standalone project. So this is the tactic that we ended up taking that worked in this situation, kind of to use uh, a microsite as a testing ground for changes, rather than trying to start from scratch right away with the main website. Um, and so it, it allowed us to kind of step back and do more of a real design thinking process to create mood boards. And even though they had this original um, you know, logo and brand that they were working with, we were able to add a lot of new um, ideas. And the design that resulted uh, really is much more, uh, much more streamlined and um, kind of allowed us to do some, add some new design patterns that then they can take and work back into the main site. And importantly, it also allowed us to rethink the information architecture from scratch and just design it for recruitment alone. So that's kind of one, one option. Um, another, another kind of story that you, you know, might come out of your project is what we did for the Georgia Tech Library Project. So they were on you know, a, a modern version of Drupal, Drupal 8. So they needed some kind of technology upgrade, but upgrading from you know, Drupal 8 to 9, 9 to 10, this doesn't mean you have to redesign, right? There's no migration involved. Um, so that didn't push us to do any, any major changes to the content, but they did want to revamp their design. So we use the word revamp. <laughs> I know sometimes it's political. What word do you use? Refresh, redesign, revamp. Um, and we think of like a refresh or a revamp as being more subtle changes. But that being said, between the left and right here, you obviously have, it looks like a new website. So people might think that you've started from scratch. Um, but this project didn't, in, it didn't require, um, you know, re migrating content. It didn't require changing the menu structure or um, massively doing, you know, a full content strategy for the whole project. Instead, we were able to just focus on um, updating the look and feel so that the site felt more compelling. Um, and also, it allowed us to focus on some key features like services and search that really served the campus community. 
And the, um, I think the strength of this is that we were able to create a, a new look that appealed more to the internal audience. So I think sometimes in higher education, we think, okay, if it's a recruitment website, we've got to think about the, um, this is a marketing project because it's external facing. But in fact, in this case, the library at Georgia Tech really wanted people to use their services more. People just weren't aware of all the services that they offer. Um, a lot of their collection is digital only, so they needed to kind of sell their, their work and their content to the campus community. So I think that the, the design in this case really served that purpose. Um, and so in this case, you know, it's not a it's not a rebrand, it's not a complete redesign, and yet they're able to make these investments in the existing site and the existing um, architecture. And you know, they were already using components before. They were using um, uh, they had the ability to you know, build compelling landing pages before, um, but we kind of enhanced that and made it more visually appealing. So now uh, we come to the third story and we'll go into a bit more depth on this one. And this is the um, upgrade to, uh, to Drupal at the time, Drupal 8. And this is when Evolving Web uh, started working with John and his team at SBIA. So I'll let him talk a little bit more about this project. Definitely, thank you, Suzanne. Um, as she mentioned, uh, what really drove uh, the, the initial work of this project was obviously getting off of uh, Drupal 7 into Drupal 8. Um, but with a close eye to more you know, focused on content, bringing it off of the page into more of those content collections and really focusing on the UX improvement. So you'll see here um, on the left, uh, it's very stale, very stagnant, more brochure-like. Um, and then here on the right, uh, we've introduced um, some of those content collections um, and, and things to just sort of bring, bring the text and information uh, to life. Um, we did this uh, through a number of ways. We partnered with our, our usability lab at the university and did a lot of user testing, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, we developed sort of a design system with design components that were, evil, that were easily uh, be able to sort of plug and play on different landing pages uh, throughout the site as well. So moving ahead uh, quickly, sort of, you know, what does that sort of post-launch now look like and, and sort of where we've been going for these past several years uh, after we launched the site? So as I mentioned, we started this uh, pre-COVID um, and then we launched during COVID, but ever since then we've been doing some user research and UX improvements um, with the eye on you know, upgrading to Drupal 9, Drupal 10, and sort of beyond. Um, additionally, and, and spoiler alert, uh, we'll be going through sort of a rebrand um, later in the coming year, um, and, and we'll get to that as well. So this is uh, one key fact. Uh, we just surveyed some, um, some uh, prospective students and why they decided to apply to SPIA. Um, again, this, this research was done with our usability lab and um, with Suzanne and her team as well. Um, due to some navigational changes, uh, we implemented a robust search system with popular search terms and facets to make the information you know, easily to be found um, and really try to um, put ourselves in the shoes of the user um, to uh, guide them to what they're coming to the website for. Touching a little bit on sort of those content collections, right? So um, we, I, I work with the public affairs and communications team and we do a lot of news. So this is sort of a news collection uh, block here. Um, towards the bottom, we have sort of the stats and facts of why choose SPIA. And then over here on the right, we uh, highlight some of our faculty and more of a timeline approach, um, but with some iconography of the building, which is, which is very unique to the school. Um, unlike the previous site, we really wanted this site to be sort of media rich, media first. Uh, we, f we felt that through our uh, usability testing, and, and, and the like that students, pr prospective students, and um, really respond to that, uh, particularly videos and such. So 
At the top, we have an ambient video feature, and then we have a different uh, call to action that's more people oriented. So these are some of our leadership guests that we bring in every year. We've utilized the same component to, uh, to feature current students. Um, so like, you know, Meet John, Etsy, or, or whatever have you. All of these things sort of combined, you know, help us, helped us to sort of define this sort of new strategy, right? And it helped us develop this more targeted approach with our content. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the, the previous site really didn't allow for a lot of videos, a lot of, fo uh, a lot of photos, um, and, and that kind of stuff. So we were able to sort of adopt this sort of mixed media approach. You know, we have podcasts now on the website. Um, this has shown great increase into our audience and expansion um, for prospective students um, around the globe. Um, and lastly, this helps us sort of respond to the changing needs of the school. We've actually had a new dean um, that, that's more, um, that likes to see more of this sort of mixed media approach uh, with podcasts and, and video testimonials, et cetera. So under the hood, this allowed us to sort of, you know, evaluate in real time, like, are we up to date? You know, security updates were, were a little bit more seamless. Um, PHP upgrades. Um, and again, it's just sort of allowed us to sort of take that technical debt and just be able to look forward a little bit. Because um, at the school, we're a really small team, um, and we really don't have the, the time to sort of give that justice that it needs. Additionally, uh, as part of responding uh, to changing needs, we've had integrations come and go over the years. Faculty directories, um, we now have the ability to sort of push and pull from different uh, centers and programs. We have 20 centers and programs that are affiliated with the school. Um, there's a new uh, events platform on campus called Campus Groups, so we're able to connect with that. Um, and of course, uh, single sign-on as well. And I'll turn it back to Suzanne. Yeah, so thanks, John. Like, what I love about the SPIA project is how much the site has really evolved since it launched. Um, I'm not necessarily involved in the project day to day, so when I look back at it, I really see these, these major improvements that have been made to content, um, the evolution just based on changes to what the school's priorities are in terms of the messaging. Um, and so I think what's important for us to keep in mind all when we're working on our own projects is that when we're in the midst of a, a redesign, we want to be thinking ahead to what that, what those, you know, hopefully four or five years are like between redesigns when we're going to be making these continuous improvements. So we want to make sure that the components we build are flexible enough to at least accommodate these strategic changes. Or we want to anticipate that, oh, if we put a directory in place, maybe one day that's going to be driven from an integration. So let's make sure that that content's super granular. So we want to think about that in the redesign. And then again, when we're doing the, the work between redesigns, when we're making investments in our site, we want to be thinking maybe ahead to the next um, to the next project. Like in in the case of Spia, we know we're already thinking about a rebrand, um, even though it's not happening quite yet. And so, with that in mind, I'll I'll bring us to our uh, kind of fourth story of a, you know possible approach to working on your your uh, investing in your website. And um, in this case, it's. It's, uh, you know, maybe websites where we're a little bit more constrained, and I actually have several examples. So who here is working on a website where you don't just get to do whatever configuration you want or install whatever modules do you want? Who here is kind of locked down? Great. And, and even people who didn't raise your hand, like maybe you're at a school where some of the websites um, have that situation or you're serving other, other um, site builders who are in that situation. Um, yeah, so often Drupal is used as a CMS that's um, meant to serve more than one website, um, and we can't just change the configuration at will. Um, and so when we're looking to make improvements, it's not, it's sometimes frustrating. Like you come to DrupalCon and people are like, oh, well, you can just make a new content type and 
kind of shake your head like, oh, I wish I could make a new content type in my CMS. <laughs> um, and so often, you know, we have to work with what we have. Um, so my first uh, suggestion here, I have a, a, a few, are, um, are related to your components. So assuming that you have a website that is component-based already, maybe you're, and when I say component-based, I mean maybe you're using paragraphs, maybe you're using Layout Builder and you have block types available, and you kind of have these building blocks for creating pages. You know, Dries was talking this morning about the new uh, concept of experience builder, um, and that too will have components that are these building blocks that we can use. Um, and so if you're working with an existing set of components, one thing to do is to have a playground where you can kind of experiment with those. So I know sometimes when I go to a, publish a page on a Drupal site that I'm contributing to in some way, uh, sometimes it's hard to know exactly which are the best components, like, oh, what, what are my favorite? kinds of um, blocks or my favorite kinds of paragraphs to work with. And so having a place where you can experiment, maybe a staging site could really, can really help with this. Um, and to kind of see like what, you know, if I'm going to create a new page, like why would I use this component over the other and kind of what's the rhythm I'm trying to build on the page. So just taking that time to experiment. Um, this is one of the websites that uses the Georgia Tech um, kind of standard install. And of course, there's many different types of um, options when you're creating pages on that platform. Um, but you can kind of think through, OK, if I'm creating something that's a home page, maybe I don't have a specific you know, home page content block, but I want to have this kind of messaging, and I want to make sure that there's these calls to actions. So one thing I always look for is, like, what's the flow of headings on the page? Um, not trying to have too many calls to action always popping right up. Yeah, and I mentioned before, um, the school has 20 centers and programs, and this is one of our um, centers and programs, the Center for Policy Research on Energy and the Environment. And we did a little study with them. This is their homepage. Um, and through some user research, uh, we determined, you know, what's really important to them? Well, it's, it's their breadth and depth of knowledge and research around energy and the environment. So we sort of um, compiled that and, and put that into different buckets. Um, so we took this more sort of topical approach on their homepage, um, and we've we've seen really great results with that um, here. Yeah, and and in this case, I think topics. Are, it's not necessarily that you have to have a content type for topics, or but these are just um, components that follow that kind of structure of having topics being the driving force for how the content is going to be organized, um, and leveraging the components to do that. Um, here's another example. So uh, York University, another university up in Canada, um, huge uh, organization with a lot of different websites on Drupal and WordPress. Um, and in their case, they have a good, really, really great documentation for what they call modules, which are components. Um, but when we went to, say, create something like how do we highlight events, they don't have this nice pre-built um, full width event block that we can use or event component that we can use. But instead, what we did is just assembled that based on you know, a dynamic list of events plus a uh, kind of image, um, car a large image card that can go alongside the events to make it look like, oh, events are really important. We're going to highlight this. And visually, it's going to take up more space on the page. So just the way you can combine components to make um, the, the kind of rhythm of your content feel like the, the rhythm that you want to create or the experience that you want to build. You know, users are spending more time looking at events because visually it's taking up more presence on the page. That can also achieve your goals. Um, getting more mileage out of your WYSIWYG editor. So <laughs> who here has a love-hate relationship with WYSIWYG? Yeah, I always feel like, oh, if only we didn't have to use the WYSIWYG editor. But when you reach the limits of maybe what you can do with components, or if you're not even working on a site that has many components to start with, um, you might find yourself doing a lot in the WYSIWYG editor. Um, and so the example here on this page is there's uh, a, a section here that has 
a bunch of calls to action. So there's no component on this website that's just like four call to action buttons. But luckily, through our WYSIWYG editor, we have some styles. So getting to know your WYSIWYG editor, knowing the formatting options, having, again, like a playground where you can experiment with them and <laughs> test things out. What does it look like if I put four calls to action next to each other? Um, it might give you the results that you need. Um, and so just getting that familiarity and investing and learning that um, can be really worthwhile. So on this page, you know, we don't have custom components for anything. Yes, there is a, a nice, you know, news feed here, but the rest of the page is just built with, um, with WYSIWYG editor, you know, text, standard text component. Um, calls to action are obviously a huge part of the user experience. So on any website as a content contributor, you know, you are contributing to the user experience and a lot of that comes from how users are, um, you know, how users find pathways through the site. And that could be largely based on the calls to action that you choose to, to include. So if you have some um, components that are particularly good at positioning those calls to action, like this um, component at the bottom here, really pulls in the attention of the user, kind of has this arrow. Um, and so understanding the role that a component can play and a call to action can play, and looking at your pages, sometimes it's hard if you're really in there in the content, but kind of, you know, uh, taking a step back and thinking, well, what is the call to action on this page? If I was a user coming here, how would I know what to do next? Um, if I'm trying to apply or I'm trying to dig into this program more, are there 10 calls to action on the page? And maybe that's too many. Um, and so thinking through that experience and just taking the time to, to walk through where the CTAs lead you um, can lead to a much better experience without doing uh, major, major redesign or major uh, information architecture work. Um, and then finally, the, uh, uh, in terms of content structure, you also have a lot of control over how the user feel, um, feels in terms of there being a structure, in terms of how you might use components. So these are cards. I think often websites have a card component that displays in a grid like this. It's, it's a pretty typical component to have. Um, but I've seen them be used in a lot of ways where um, each card has a completely different purpose. Um, and you might find really um, you know, heterogeneous content kind of crammed into, oh, we're just going to put it all in a grid of cards. Because a grid of cards kind of looks modern. It kind of looks organized. But actually using them in a way where every card represents a, a collection of things that go together, um, that can really help users process the content and understand it better. Um, so thinking about how you're using cards or how you're, how you're trying to display a lot of links um, in a small area can be really helpful. And I like to think for higher education websites, there's often these pages that I call um, wayfinding landing pages. And this, this particular page comes from um, a current student's website. So often, again, we're trying to build this really nice marketing experience for new recruits, but we um, often for current students or the existing campus community, we just have so much content that they might need. Um, and so finding a way to create a wayfinding landing page where you have some key links there where people can dive into the information, but it doesn't just feel like a wall of links um, is, is often something that uh, is really helpful. So you can think about whether a page like that might be a useful construct for your site. And it's not something that you necessarily have to create a new content type for or a new component for. It's something that you can just start doing through the, um, the information architecture you already have. OK, so I have some screenshots with spreadsheets. But it's still day one of DrupalCon, so hopefully you can handle it. <laughs> All right, the first one here is about content governance. Who here has a content governance plan? Okay, not so, so lots of opportunity here. You can be very excited about this spreadsheet. I love this spreadsheet. Um, I, wish, I wish I had this for more projects uh, that we could kind of use and, and go back to. This is actually, I didn't take one from a client project. Instead, I used the one for Drupal.org because I'm working on the project to uh, hopefully 
rebranddrupal.org, and we came up with a content governance uh, plan, rough draft. Um, and so basically what you want a content governance plan to be, you want it to tell you who's responsible for what. And the reason this is part of like a continued investment in your website is that you don't necessarily need to just use Drupal to have roles and permissions that tell you who can edit what content. Um, you can put that structure in place independent of your website. It just has to kind of reflect the content on your website and the types of pages and components that you have. So when I think about a content governance spreadsheet, I always think about the rows as being different types of content, but not content types like we have in Drupal, because it could be that you have you know, one that's a content type, like a, like a, a center or a publication or a news item, but you could have other ones that are actually just a component on your homepage, a very important component that somebody has to be responsible for updating. Um, and so it really depends on the kind of content, what kinds of rows that you have. So you can think about it as being like, okay, my homepage has all these stats about how great the university is, who's in charge of updating the stats, or who's in charge of making sure the ones we pick make sense. Um, your content governance plan also should tell you something about how to review the content, like how are you, what's the criteria for success, and when does content have to be updated. It should hopefully also tell you who the primary audience is for the content, because sometimes you lose track of that and a new person starts and they're like, why do we have um, programs listing anyway? Like who's meant to look at that content? Is it current students? Is it potential students? Um, and then it can also have some key calls to action so that you don't lose track of those and somebody doesn't go along and delete your call to action that has to be there for the content to make sense. So um, having a really simple spreadsheet that just, you know, I, I find it's different for every project. We don't always have the same columns, um, but it, you want it to kind of tell you a little bit about how that content needs to be updated and who's responsible. And the who's responsible, unfortunately, might be multiple people with a bunch of columns, but hopefully you can keep it relatively simple. And then the other spreadsheet that you might want to build is around content improvement. So content governance plan is a nice kind of high level. Here's all our types of content and here's who's in charge. But then a more um, kind of uh, that's kind of more a bird's eye view, but a more detailed look could be around, okay, here's a really key page on our site. Now, what are all the things we want to fix about it? So you could have a spreadsheet that's really just for um, updating all of, the, all of the elements of content on a single page, if that page is so important. Um, and you can kind of make an analysis of all the problems with the page. Uh, if you go through and see, oh, like this page is too wordy, it, does, it has this accessibility issue, you're making a row for every single issue you find, and then you're identifying, you know, how could we fix it? And this can be a really helpful thing for someone on the web team to do because you have uh, knowledge of your content, you have knowledge of you know, best practices writing for the web, um, but you might not be in a position to make all the fixes yourself because you're not the subject matter expert. And so often this kind of thing could be handed off to a subject matter expert to do some of the writing um, and we're providing recommendations um, without telling somebody, ah, oh, this content sucks, it's out of date, and being really negative, you're just being like, oh, look at all these great suggestions I have for your content. Um, and you can see the very polite, you know, good, better <laughs> kind of indications here that we put into our recommendations. Um, so, done with the spreadsheets. You can all breathe a sigh of relief. Um, some other content changes that you can make if you're investing in content, you know, you can be thinking about content investments purely as, oh, we have to create a plan, we have to rewrite all this content. These things can take many hours of investment. But what can be a simpler um, investment in your content is just being more intentional about the curation that you're doing. So who here has some kind of curation you can do on your website? Sounds so hoity-toity, Cur I'm curating the content, like you're a museum designer. Um, yeah, but it is, it is a really important task, actually, curating content. So maybe on your homepage, you have some kind of, um, of 
listing where the content isn't just aggregated automatically. It's not just a list of all the news items um, from your university, or it's not just all the news items that um, are related to SBIA, for example. Instead, maybe you get the opportunity to pick and choose what shows in that homepage element. Um, and that was the case for this project for Queen's University. They really wanted to position themselves as more of this research institution that attracts really um, internationally known faculty. Um, and so they wanted to be much more intentional about the content that they put on their homepage and not just select everything coming from the Queen's Gazette, which is their, which is their newspaper. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe in your redesign, you replace the dynamic block actually with something curated, and then that gives you the ability over time to uh, really be more careful about, you know, your message and the type of content that you're selecting and have criteria around how you select that content. Like, oh, we always want to have something research related. We always want to have something that talks about our reputation. And then, you know, here's some other categories that are specific to our current needs. Um, also, in terms of content investments, um, sure, being higher ed folks, majority in the room, you are all really well versed in accessibility or um, know that it's a really important thing to invest in. And we often think of accessibility as just being a, do I comply or not? But of course, if we think about it, it's a much, you know, it's a much broader thing than that. There's so much to invest in in terms of accessibility. We need the design to be accessible. We need all of our templates in Drupal to be accessible. Um, and then the content itself needs to be accessible. So just because you have an outdated theme that maybe has some accessibility issues, it doesn't mean that it's not worth investing in your content accessibility. So while you're waiting for that redesign when maybe you can make some of the bigger accessibility fixes you need to make, um, there's nothing stopping you from improving content accessibility. And I know at Princeton, they've developed a tool called Editorially. Uh, has, is anyone here using that module? Yeah, so it's a really it's a really great tool because it's specifically for content authors. So it's uh, designed to help you fix the content issues um, on the page, not at the level of templates or the the greater design, but more at the level of like, oh, you added this video and it has these issues, or you put in headings and it doesn't comply because you skipped a heading or something like this. Um, and so um, what I recommend is you know, using a tool like that, making sure you have something in place for your content editors to use. You can do an accessibility audit that's a bit more content specific and doesn't try to address the bigger issues that you don't have the time at the moment to fix anyway. You know, Obviously, that's important too, but put that in a separate bucket. And then picking like a high impact issue to focus on. Like some sites just have so many PDFs, maybe you can you know, really help things out by investing and cleaning those up and reducing the number of PDFs or making the PDFs accessible. Um, and then I'll just mention a couple more things. Um, one thing that you might be trying to do in terms of uh, redesign is actually think more about the brand of your institution within a bigger institution. So how many here work for like an uh, organization that has a sub-brand. So SBIA is a great example. You know, it's within the bigger Princeton brand. Um, uh, so this is just a screenshot from a project we did for York University. They also have this bigger brand, but the um, school uh, um, AMPD, which is arts, Arts, Media, Performance, and Design, thanks Lisa. Uh, it, it, so obviously design school also, like they have um, an interest in creating a site that's compelling visually. Um, and they wanted to break out a little bit of the standard components they had available. So up above are all the components that the university was offering. This was not uh, enough, <laughs> it didn't give enough kind of dynamic feel. Um, and so what we did was think more about how can we just use the images on the site to feel like a like more dynamic and to um, give more depth to the brand. So we didn't try to redesign the components, we just used them more as is, but then 
we uh, thought more about images. And uh, I think additionally since then we've done some redesign of components, but it's, it's not what we relied on to create that sub-brand feel. Um, another way you can create a sub-brand is more with content. So thinking of the tone and voice that you use, like the actual headings especially, uh, really create a strong impression. Um, so having some different, you know, just running a workshop of for tone and voice. If you've never done this before, you can come ask me for more details after, but um, basically trying to figure out what does our organization want to sound like. Um, and that's it. So those are all just ideas for investments in your website between rebrands. But we wanted to come back to the idea of a rebrand and back to the story of SPIA and what they're planning next. So you've done all this work and you realize that uh, it's really time for you to sort of position yourself, you know, going off that last slide that Suzanne showed. And how do you do that? And really that's with sort of a, a rebrand. Um, so Princeton is in the process of sort of updating their branding guidelines um, through a number of ways. Um, just some examples here on the screen, um, just sort of updated iconography. Um, taking a little bit more of a bolder approach with some more bolder color palettes here. Um, you'll see this image to the right is a, a little bit of a masking technique uh, with a scholar book. Uh, additionally, uh, the university is encouraging the different schools uh, to sort of use this lockup um, logo, if you will. So we have the Princeton Shield on the left and um, SPIA logo on the right. Um, a couple of new font variations here, um, and again, um, some play with, with some of those iconography as well. Yeah. And, uh, and we're ex you know, excited about the idea of, oh yeah, we can do this rebrand, we can um, change a bit how the site is put together. Um, I think one of the other things that is food for thought is whether, um, changing the experience in the back end for content authors is also something that requires a bigger um, redevelopment of a website. So you heard Dries talk about the experience builder. I think a lot of people are excited about changing their site to make it easier for content authors to have autonomy, um, to have this great experience for staff updating the website. And sometimes that requires a lot of changes to the information architecture itself. So maybe you're, you don't have as many components available right now and you want to have more. Or maybe you want not just the content of a page to be flexible, but also the layout. Um, so some, you know, some schools have moved from paragraphs to layout builder, for example, to give that kind of autonomy. And that is something that can require a bigger um, investment and not just, oh, we can just fit this into the support and maintenance budget kind of thing. Um, so I think it's something to consider is that the front end of the website should be driving um, your investments and kind of the, the user experience that you're providing. But also you got to think about your your content editors on the back end and the experience they have because that has a direct impact on the site that, that you get um, in the end. So you wanted to have a few instant takeaways because I know this talk covered a lot of different ideas and like, oh, you can invest in this or that. Um, but you all have websites, I assume, that you can go back next week to your desk and um, work on. And so how do, you, how do we spend our time and what are some things we should be doing more of? So here are just some ideas of things you can maybe start doing without you know, having to get approval from your boss for like a more budget or more time or just like ideas to just help you do your work better. Um, so one idea we thought of was the, uh, is just having fresh eyes on your website and John had mentioned having a, you know, maybe a new colleague starts and you just want to show them the website. So that's an opportunity to kind of look at it from their perspective and like, what are some pain points that maybe you hadn't thought of or what are their first impressions when they see the site? Um, of course, you can also do a bigger set of user research, which takes maybe a bit more more work, but even just showing the site to one person and kind of collecting that impression can be helpful. Um, I think most people can invest in improving content accessibility, so think of one thing you can do, whether it's doing a high-level audit or just having a tool like editorially in place, that can be a, a good way to start. 
Um, and then doing something around your content governance plan. I know I didn't see a ton of hands saying you had a content governance plan. So just thinking it through and maybe drafting a spreadsheet and seeing what folks think and um, seeing if there's a way to Im iteratively improve your content through a tool like that. So these are our ideas. We would love to hear more about all of your projects and chat with you more. Um, so I hope this is the start of good conversations and I hope you're all coming to the Higher Ed Summit on Thursday so that you can have um, great collaborations with colleagues. So thanks, thanks everyone and open up the questions. I don't know if there is even time for questions. <laughs> but feel free to come up. If you but if not, uh, feel free to come up and ask us. We are here and happy to chat. And uh, feel free to reach out as well. <laughs>